Hey guys, in this video, I really would just want to share with you my exact business model and really walk through some more uh, deep business stuff, kind of step by step that I think will be really helpful for you. And in detailing this Tacoma, this maintenance detail here, I'm going to show you guys how simple you can really do this using one product and just a couple of tools. So just to give you guys a little bit of context, this Tacoma, you see me detailing. This is a maintenance client here. Super, super clean already probably one of the cleaner uh, vehicles that I have and uh, just extremely easy to address. Now the only product that you're going to see me use in this video is Meguiar's All-Purpose Cleaner and just for you guys who are wondering, Meguiar's All-Purpose Cleaner is really the APC that I reserve. I always dilute it 10 to 1, rarely do I change that dilution. It's really the all-purpose cleaner that I reserve for all my maintenance clients. It's kind of like what I would consider just a very, very mild uh, cleaner that I can trust. It's not going to leave, it's not caustic, it's not going to leave any like white marks or residue. And it's not the most powerful all purpose cleaner in the detailing world, in my opinion. When I'm dealing with really dirty trucks or something like that, I'm going to reach for the Renegade uh, Citrus all purpose cleaner. But when I'm dealing with maintenance clients, this is generally what I'm going to use. In fact, sometimes you can even dilute it uh, heavier than 10 to 1, something like 12 or 15 to 1, especially with a vehicle that's this clean. The tools that you're going to see me using in this video is number one, you're going to see my classic non-abrasive scrub pads. That's that little blue pad. These can be bought at like Kroger, Walmart, whatever, you know, your like Walmart store is where you live. You can also buy them off Amazon for like a dollar fifty, I think like super, super cheap, still super cheap in the store. And then the interior microfiber towels that I'm using here are just uh, members mark brand. It's actually the Sam's brand, just their, their generic Sam's brand. I love these microfiber towels for the interior. I go through them like crazy. I buy them in 36 packs uh, and they're just extremely useful, really good cleaning towels specifically, a good ratio as far as microfiber towels go uh, with their makeup. And then I'm using the detail, the work stuff detailing brushes to get in all the crevices. And then finally, of course, I've got my trusty uh, VX5000 steamer with me. I don't go anywhere without it. And I'm using that for all the hard to reach areas. Now, I really want to break down here exactly how I built my detailing business and more or less kind of tell you guys a bit of a story story of how I came to the conclusion that I now live in. So just so you guys know, I started my detailing business when I was 13. I actually asked my dad, I was like, Hey dad, how can I make money? And he said, and I don't know why, by the way, <laughs> I asked that to my dad, you know, it's not like my parents were money hungry people and I was thinking about it all the time. Uh, but for whatever reason, I think entrepreneurship is just sometimes in people's blood. And so I just said, dad, how can I make money? And he said, well, you can always make money doing what nobody else wants to do. And I remember him telling me a story about his friend in college who made a lot of money detailing cars. Uh, and I thought, well, who wants to clean their car? And so that's where it actually all started. And I started detailing cars for $20 a car, not $20 an hour, $20 a car. I would uh, print off flyers and uh, business cards from the UPS store. My dad would, of course, pay for them because he's a good dad. And I would go hand them out door to door, knock on people's doors, tell them what I was doing. And I charged $20. And of course, my detailing business was not nearly as detailed as it is today. That was, you know, 10 years ago now, but uh, it was a detailing business nonetheless. Now, over time, uh, somewhere around in high school, uh, I had built up my detailing business to several, I mean, really the best way to say it is just in the greater Nashville area, um, I was kind of known as the guy who, who details and had built up a pretty significant reputation by the time I was about 16, uh, especially when I was 17. I'd say 17 is really like the turning point in my business. And by turning point, what I mean is I just had had too much business. Uh, that was the point where I had to start turning people away. And there's something really interesting that happened when that happened. I, I started to realize that I, I had this good problem on my hands where I actually needed to raise my prices because, you know, if you just think about it in a basic sort of free market economic sense, because I had a large amount of people calling me, uh, I didn't need every person to say yes. In fact, I only needed a very small portion of those people to say yes to my prices. And that way, uh, without having to to hire a lot of employees, I could increase the amount of money I was making. And so in the detailing business, you know, you kind of have this quandary of, well, how do I make more money? And this probably extends to more than just the detailing business, of course, but number one, I can get more customers or number two, I can raise my prices. You know, those are basically the, the two answers. Well, if you're already working a fair amount, there's only so many hours you can work in a day. And so the answer to that problem or the solution I came to at that time when I was 17, especially when I was 18, actually, uh, and I had just started college, I significantly 
significantly raised my prices. And that was the answer to that pricing question. How do I start making more money? Because that was the question I was asking. I was working a lot and I thought, man, uh, unless I start hiring employees and getting vans and getting other people to do this and training people, it's going to be difficult to start growing. So what can I do at least right now while I'm in school to start making a significant amount uh, uh, more money, at least significant enough to make a difference in my life to where uh, it would it would matter? And the answer to that question was to raise my prices. Now, of course, to get to that point, uh, basically what led me there was an overflow of customers. And so this is the first point I want to make. Uh, this is the business model that I chose or the business structure or sequence or process that I chose uh, when I was about 17, 18. I said, listen, if I'm going to have a problem, I want it to be too many customers, not not enough. Uh, it's kind of like money, right? You can kind of have two different problems with money. You can have not enough or too much. And, you know, I think you'd probably rather have the latter. It's the same thing in business. I would rather be saying, no to people than uh, having to be having to say yes to everyone out of some sort of desperation. Uh, while of course it's not ever awesome to say no to somebody, it's a lot better than having to say yes to everybody. And so just take note of that as I kind of continue down this train of thought. Uh, the first significant thing that happened was I had an influx of customers that was actually too much work for me to handle. So I raised my prices and I continued to do that, started making a much more significant amount of money. Uh, especially when I was in college. It was uh, a, a lot of money, I think, for a college student, uh, especially running my own business. It felt like a significant amount of money at the time, plenty to live on at least. And that being said, I started doing some very simple things as far as like investing in my retirement and and some pretty simple, you know, made some pretty simple financial decisions uh, that I thought, hey, this would set me up well in the future. But as I kept going, I still reached this plateau. And what basically happened is I was like, okay, this is great. I've got plenty of customers coming in um, and I've raised my prices to a significant enough amount to where, hey, this is making a difference in my life. But I'm running into a new problem where yes, I've reached a plateau that's much higher than it was before. But even with that, there are only so many hours in the day that I can work. And so I've reached this plateau. And while it's higher than before, it's nonetheless still a plateau. And when you're not growing, you know, that doesn't feel very good. Um, and so my thought process was, hey, uh, this is the point where I'm going to have to start uh, hiring some employees and growing that way because the way I'm going to increase my income here, uh, I don't want to keep raising my prices because I think we can probably all agree, depending on what area you live in, uh, you're going to reach a sort of point of diminishing return where you can raise your prices to a certain level, but after that level, you're going to start experiencing like so many people saying no, it's uh, it's just outside of uh, like the reasonable price range. And so I wouldn't say that my prices are necessarily reasonable uh, compared to other people in my area. I'm certainly one of the most expensive probably, but that being said, there is still a price that I will not raise to because it just doesn't make sense where it's like, hey, nobody in their right mind is going to pay this amount of money for detailing. And so I kind of reached this point where I was saying, you know, I don't think it's wise to raise my price higher than what I'm at right now. So that cannot be my solution the second time around. So it's going to have to be employees. And so I went through a process of uh, tr uh, interviewing people. I had uh, certain things that I had people do to figure out who they were going to or who I wanted to hire and how I wanted to hire them. Uh, and I went through uh, different employees. I w most of them were young. Most of them uh, were either like college age, but not in college or in college, but still had a significant amount of time. And so uh, some of them were a little younger, a little older, same age as me. And uh, basically, you know, what I ran into was a training problem. Uh, what ended up happening was uh, the difficulty I found was trying to train guys who looked at this job as more of something as a turnaround job that was not going to be something they did for a significant amount of time. So it took a significant amount of time to train them and to prepare them for the job they were going to do. And yet it seemed like when that training was over, they were already moving on. And so that didn't feel sustainable to me, at least at that point in my life uh, either. It just didn't make sense for me to do. And so I really thought about this problem and thought, hey, 
I'm going to need to get creative with this. This was about the time I started the online side of my business because I love to teach and education is, is probably my passion even more than detailing is. So I love detailing, but I love teaching and, and education and uh, all that sort of stuff even more. That's part of why I'm creating this online course because it's really exciting, I think, to see the way education is moving online and how uh, people of all different kinds, all different kinds of people have access to education that just didn't have access to education uh, back in, you know, 10, 20 years ago. It's just a really cool trend that I want to be a part of. But that being said, that's kind of beside the point. I started thinking about this thing with the employees. Hey, this isn't really working out. It's not something that I have a ton of time to train people on. Heck, I'm in, I'm in school. I, I'm in school like uh, 15 hours. Uh, what is it? I was taking 15 hours that semester, I remember. So, you know, I had uh, several hours of classes every day. And so the other, the only other solution I really came to was I need to add more hours in the day because if I could, if I could detail one or two more vehicles in the day, uh, I could make a lot more money without necessarily having to raise my prices. And even so, if I hired one, two, three employees, I would only get through one or two more vehicles a day anyways. You know, that one or two employees, they're not going to speed me up so significantly that we get through 10 cars. And so I thought, man, how do I add hours to the day? Well, obviously I can't add hours, but I can cut down on the time that any given vehicle is taking me. And by the way, guys, I'm just kind of talking through my thought process here of this, like this, this several years of what this looked like. But if you like this information, smash the like button below this video because heck, this is all free information. There was a time where people couldn't get education like this and it's totally free. So smashing the like button is free too. So if you like this video, just hit the like button. It'll help this video get out to more detailers who might need this information. So all of that being said, I thought, hey, I'm going to need to start cracking down on the amount of time I am taking in order to get these details done. If I can move cars a little bit faster than I am, which is difficult for me because I'm totally OCD and I'm a perfectionist and I want to make sure it looks incredible and hold my reputation. I started thinking, hey, I've got some clients that I see on a regular basis and these clients take virtually no time. It's not a logarithmic regression. If you think about, um, if you think about this mathematics, Automatically, when a vehicle is already clean and I see it on a, on a regular basis, on a weekly, you know, biweekly, monthly basis, let's say the average sedan takes me four hours. The maintenance client uh, doesn't take me, you know, half that time. It takes me, it reduces exponentially. You know, it'll take a quarter of that time. It'll take less than a quarter. It'll take 45 minutes of that original four hours. Um, and so it's kind of a logarithmic reduction. It, it, it doesn't, or I'm sorry, it's like an exponential reduction. It doesn't, it doesn't reduce in any sort of steady pace, which is actually the beauty of it. It's kind of like compound interest in reverse because you're trying to save time. And so I thought, man, if I could structure my business in a way where I basically only targeted this type of clientele and this became 100% of my business, I could figure out a monthly minimum that I want my business to do uh, in a revenue sense and make sure that I'm hitting that every single month because I can extrapolate out based on the maintenance clients that I already have scheduled what that is going to produce. And then anything on top of that, that I want to take in my detailing business with new customers that I'm getting like five, 10, 20 calls a day, that's going to be icing on the cake. And that can be revenue that really exponentially, uh, uh, increases the business I'm doing because I can reinvest all of that. I mean, I can do uh, all different sorts of stuff with that, uh, virtually extra business revenue on top of really that increase that the maintenance clients would bring. And so I began this like journey of making this maintenance client thing, my number one priority. This was like everything to me. I did not compromise in this area. And I got a lot of advice from a lot of people that talked about getting employees and all this sort of stuff. And while that is totally a, a, a legitimate route to take, that is just not the route that I wanted to take just because long term, I knew where I wanted to be in businesses and, and different things that I was doing. And I didn't want to focus a ton of time training employees in the detailing side of things. And so this is what I call the maintenance client heaven because it totally revolutionized 
revolutionized the way I did business. I could actually not only uh, stop having to take a bunch of calls and scheduling things and taking all of the time that it takes to educate new customers, communicate with them properly on the front end, build the, the reputation with them, schedule them out. I had all of these things scheduled on the front end with clients that took no time because they were regular clients. The details themselves took no time and it freed me up. Not only was I making more money then than I was at any other point in my detailing business, but it freed me up to focus my time in all other sorts of areas in my detailing business and do things my way instead of being pigeon held to these customers that were new and that wanted, you know, deals and all this sort of stuff because I had to say yes, because once again, in the detailing business, most people build detailing businesses where they're just taking new clients all the time. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if you ever take a business class, like in college, one of the first things they're going to tell you is it's always better. It's always less expensive to do more business business with a customer that already exists than it is to go out and acquire a new customer. This is particularly true in the kind of context that I'm talking about right now. And what was really amazing, this I, st I started seeing this pattern and this kind of phenomenon start to like blossom in my business, this power of compounding that I keep referring to. In some sense, I felt like I would be burdening people by sort of selling them on a maintenance program because in my head, at least at the time when I was about, when I really started doing this was when I was 18. And so when I was about 17, I, I had thought about this a lot, but when I was 18 is really when I started implementing it. Before I started implementing this, this really heightened maintenance detail strategy and business structure, my thought process was something like this. Most people just want one detail. They don't want anything regular. They're just calling me to do a one and done thing and trying to sell them on more than what they're asking for is just going to be kind of burdensome and I'm not exactly sure how to do it. I'm not exactly sure how to even word what this is exactly and I just don't think a lot of people are going to want it. I found that the exact opposite thing was true. And I think this, I, I, I don't have any like empirical data to back this up. So like I've not run an experiment, but I can just say I've trained a lot of auto detailers into starting their business, particularly in this area. And of course I'm creating this online course right now. And so I'm thinking through all of these things, you know, they're kind of top of mind for me. Um, but my point is, most detailers build detailing businesses around constantly getting new customers. And it legitimately does not make sense. Like, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just putting it all on the table here. Like, it does not make sense. And you would not apply that same logic to virtually any other business. One of the most powerful things in the sort of business world is getting a group of customers together that bought from you and creating a sort of ever increasing bowl of customers and doing business with them in different creative, innovative ways that's further going to add value to their lives more and more and more. And in that group or that bowl of people who have already done business with you is where the real potential is. Well, the same is true of the auto detailing world. And so there's all these detailers that are pigeonholing themselves to uh, basically kind of what I would just call like this place of detailing desperation where you're completely dependent on new customers all the time. And so you feel obligated to say yes. I found that a ton of people are super interested in the maintenance detail client thing. And when I built up a critical mass of detailing, maintenance detailing clients, the word got around to where literally when people call me now, they are asking to get on a maintenance list. They're not asking me to do a one-time detail. It's like, it's almost hilarious for me to think about because there was a time when I felt like, man, I'm going to really be annoying people and burdening people if I go down this road of trying to sell them a maintenance detailing sort of thing. And what ended up happening is I created these detailing, these maintenance detail packages, and sometimes I created them to very specific people because they had very specific types of vehicles. But like to give you an example, 
I had a client who had two, or I have a client actually, uh, but uh, I don't detail for him anymore just because of all the other things going on in my business right now that are taking my time. But uh, he had two different Jaguars, a white Jaguar and a black one. Uh, They're both just sedans and he kept the black one for the weekend and the white one for uh, the daily driver. Uh, I think I mentioned this before, but I I had a customer call me one time who I had never detailed for before and he said, hey, Luke, I got your number from your, uh, you know, from Googling you, which by the way, uh, in the course, I teach all of this stuff and I'm going to teach all of this stuff. Like, how do you get people to find you without you even trying? Like, this is what ends up happening when you build a critical mass of stuff online. It's a very, very powerful thing. And still, it's more possible now than ever, especially in the detailing world, because you have all these other detailers handing out business cards and flyers. Like, it's 1989. It's like, <laughs> we're on the internet now. Why are we handing out business cards? This doesn't make sense to me. But Anyway, that being said, this guy called me and said, hey, listen, I've got a Pathfinder I drive on a daily basis. I've got a BMW sedan that I keep in the garage. I've got a... uh what was the, a big Ford F-150, big four by four, uh, truck. And then I've got a, there was one more, oh, a Jeep, uh, just a two door Jeep Wrangler. And he had all four of those cars. He worked for some sort of international pharmaceutical company. I can't remember exactly what it was. Uh, but I remember he was, uh, out of the country a lot. Actually, he gave me the code to his garage and he had somebody detailing for him before that guy got too busy, said he couldn't take the work. So this guy called me and said, can you take the work? I said, absolutely. And I detailed one of those four cars every single week. So every month, all four four of them were done, uh, but I just chose a different one to detail every week and almost probably 80% of the time he wasn't even there. Um, and not to mention, I built actually a close uh, friendship or a close, not a close, but a, a good business relationship with him uh, and sort of friendship with him as I did with basically all of my clients. And this is the next thing I wanted to get to. Um, I don't know of any better business to start in many ways for a young guy um, who wants to get into entrepreneurship, wants to get into stuff, you know, something I've found is that we kind of live in like a day and age where social media, because of the nature of social media, people are getting advertisements all the time. That's like, start an online business, start this business, start this business. And while all of those things I think are legitimate businesses and they work, um, the question is, where do you start? Where do you start with all of this? Well, I think the most logical and like reasonable answer to that question is you start where you can create cash flow today because to start a lot of these other businesses requires cash. It requires income. It requires steady income. It requires, you know, credit. It requires a lot of these things that you need to build up over a certain period of time. And detailing just works as this like this beautiful answer to like that question of how do I start? It's like you you could create cash flow with detailing today, but the point I'm getting at is the people that I have been introduced to through my detailing business has been absolutely invaluable. The maintenance client strategy that I'm talking about that became my complete business structure, the only thing I focused on because it was that powerful. This maintenance client strategy attracted a very specific type of person and those specific types of people are who I became uh, close friends with over time as I serviced their cars and then became friends with their friends and then friends with their friends and it became this incredible network of really incredible people because in a lot of ways people who are great business people are doing great things. They care about the details of their life, like their cars. A lot of times they own really nice cars and they look at their vehicles as investments. And so this kind of goes back to the point I was making in that this is so viable. It's so real. It's so possible. And how do you do it? You do it one by one by getting one maintenance client at a time, but also by understanding fundamentally that this person exists and there's a lot of them. What I mean is the maintenance client that you're looking for, that person is out there. He or she is out there. They are looking for your services and they want to see you on a regular basis because they look at their vehicle as an investment or you know what? I had several uh, just moms who were on my maintenance detail list who they had kids and they were just like, you know, 
I just find a lot of peace in driving a clean car and just it doesn't make me anxious when I get into a clean car I just feel really good and while their cars were a little bit dirtier than my other maintenance clients when I saw them once a month it was extremely easy to deal with because the dirt hadn't had time to set or anything like that still super simple but a lot of women who just had different who had a lot of kids were like hey I just want my car to be clean regularly and I know if I don't get it done regularly I'll never do it and my kids are going to destroy it I had maintenance clients of all different different shapes, sizes, people, you know, in different places, different ages, just everything you could possibly think of. All of that being said, guys, I just wanted to give you a little bit of insight into the kind of what my story looked like in auto detailing and why I think this type of business structure is so viable. And at the end of the day, guys, just so powerful. It's so, so powerful. This is where you get your time back and you can begin to exponentially increase what your business is doing. Now, for those of you who are interested in what I'm doing here, yes, I gave you a little bit of the product list on the front end, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the upholstery that I'm cleaning here because while this is a maintenance detail, the vehicle is in fantastic condition, you do get to a point where certain areas of the car need to be addressed as a sort of one-time thing. You're kind of hitting the reset button and then you can just maintain them from there. In this case, it was time to address the upholstery, but you can actually see how I'm not I'm not addressing the upholstery as I would in some sort of like intense way. This is actually one of the easiest ways to clean upholstery in my opinion. I'm simply using the Meguiar's APC diluted 10 to 1, using my white, uh, really soft drill brush, which I believe are out of stock again. Again, on Amazon, disappointing, I know. Nonetheless, plenty of options on Amazon. They don't have the detail or the care put into them that these do. Of course, there was a lot of time put into these. But that being said, the white soft, uh, soft stiffness drill brush is what I'm using here. And then I'm very simply mopping it up with a microfiber towel. I will tell you, when you're dealing with this kind of upholstery, that's sort of what I call the new upholstery, it's not your traditional fabric or fabric upholstery that you would find in like 2005 and previous, 2004 and previous uh, uh, and before vehicles that had car upholstery. That is actually, in my opinion, a lot uh, more, a lot easier to clean. It's a bit more traditional fabric. This kind of newer upholstery that all these car manufacturers are putting into vehicles, and particularly Toyota actually, like Camrys, Corollas, Tacomas, they all kind of have the same uh, entry level upholstery fabric. This is a bit harder to clean. However, uh, in this particular scenario, because it's not too dirty, I can do it pretty simply like this. But in many ways, this stuff actually needs to be extracted. I will say, however, it is much easier to experience that kind of wicking effect on this particular type of fabric than it is on others. And so I will warn you just to be careful not to introduce too much liquid, especially when the seats are already fairly clean. Now guys, I'm going to go ahead and let you sit back, relax. I'm going to stop talking. We'll put a little bit of music on. You can enjoy the rest of the detail, but stick around till the end. Of course, as always, if you want to check out any of the tools or the products that I'm using here that you see in the video, I hook up links to all of the products that I use in a really organized fashion below in the YouTube description box. So you can just click that show more button and you'll see links to all of this stuff. As always, if you are new to the Wilson auto detailing community and you've not not yet subscribed, but you like the information you're getting, then hit the subscribe button because I don't know why you wouldn't. YouTube's free, right? It's like, what do you have to lose? Hit the subscribe button and uh, tap the bell icon so you get notified when I publish videos in the future. Guys, thank you so much for watching. And as always, from Luke here at Wilson Auto Detailing, sit back, relax, enjoy the rest of the detail, keep working hard. And I will see you guys in the next video.